Hello from Stockholm and thank you so much for joining our latest Let's Talk Entrepreneurship event. Uh, just before we begin, apologies to those of you who are hoping to watch this on the live stream at the time advertised online. Unfortunately, we had some technical issues, but we do have a great discussion uh, available for you to watch back now. So this is part of a series of talks uh, coming to you from the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences, EVA, and we will be talking throughout the autumn and winter uh, with some of the biggest uh, companies and senior managers uh, in Sweden about entrepreneurship, innovation, and how all of that looks as we ease out of the pandemic. For those who don't know me, my name's Maddie Savage. I'm a journalist originally from the UK, as you can probably hear uh, from my accent, working for media such as the BBC and covering Swedish tech, innovation and culture. So it's great to be involved in these events. And I'm excited to introduce our guest today, Anna Salander. Uh, we're coming to you from uh, Eva's library, this historic Hergren's uh, library in Stockholm. But we're here to talk about uh, Anna's career, uh, Anna's work for academic work, which is one of Sweden's uh, leading uh, recruiters really for academics and also for students um, and Anna's role vice CEO and group director for people and performance at the company so thank you for being with us Anna we'll talk about that role in a moment but just a bit of background mm. you've worked for some of the leading names in Sweden Swedish business really Klarna Northvolt Ericsson a short stint at H&M, uh, so those will be very well known to, to everyone here in the Nordics. Um, academic work, also very big in this region, but perhaps uh, not so well known uh, to some of our international viewers. So just mm -hmm. give us a quick summary of, yeah. of what goes on there. Sure. So, as you said, um, recruiting, but also staffing company. Uh, very big in Sweden, but also becoming very large in Germany, Switzerland, Swe um, Finland, Denmark and Norway expanding into other areas as well, such as Academy, which is a new company that we have, a fairly new company that we have, which is in, in learning services. Uh, we have uh, IT services uh, and also expanding into, you know, new countries, new cities, um, also using what we are going to talk about today, the entrepreneurship. So lots going on. Mm -hmm. What about your specific role? Quite a big title. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what that stems down to, if you like, is basically I'm responsible for making sure that we have the best place to work for our employees, making sure that we have the conditions, the uh, environment, the support that they need to do their best to be engaged and to do an awesome work, uh, work basically. That's what it is. <laughs> You're clearly very passionate about people, but mm. before we dig into a little bit more your thoughts on company culture, entrepreneurship, I'm intrigued by this move. You were previously working mm. at Northvolt, mm. a, a very much talked about Swedish company mm. at the moment, making electric batteries, mm. revitalizing the north of Sweden. Uh, so what made you make the, make the leap? Yeah. I mean, that one, it wasn't uh, an easy decision, let's say that, to start with. Uh, Northvolt is maybe one of Sweden's coolest companies that there is right now. Um, but you, if you look a little bit what I'm really passionate about, it is really the people. And there are people also at Northvolt, that's for sure, and fantastic people. Uh, but the core there are the batteries. Uh, at Academic Work, the core are the people. It's both the people that are working inside the company, but what we do as a business. And that really triggered me to, to take this uh, decision and, and move on and become part of uh, Academic Work. Great, well, we'll get some insights from your work at these various corporations as we move through the conversation. Uh, just to say to those of you watching at home, thank you uh, for those of you who sent in questions in advance. We will get to some of those. And again, apologies to those of you hoping to be able to send in questions live. So let's talk about entrepreneurship. That's what mm. we're here for, uh, this concept. Mm. What does it mean to you and why do you think it's important for companies? Mm. Uh, maybe I'm a bit sloppy when I talk about uh, entrepreneurship uh, because I, I like to see it as a little bit of a wider concept. Everything from you know making things better uh, that doesn't necessarily have to spring into a new product or a new company or a new subsidiary maybe. Uh, and maybe that's right or wrong, I don't know really, but it is so important for every company to constantly keep developing themselves, challenging themselves, be open to new ideas, thinking 
you know, ways of doing things. And I think that for every company to survive, and especially when things are moving so quickly as they are at the moment, I think that if we're not really embracing the power of intrapreneurship, entrepreneurship, then I think that, um, yeah, survival uh, chances are not that, not that great anymore. Mm. Mm. So let's talk about how it's fed into some of the very successful companies you've worked for. What about Northvolt starting there then? Mm. So if, if you're an employee with an idea for, mm. for adapting methods mm. or yeah. coming up with a new strand, how does that translate into entrepreneurship? How do you put mm. that into action, yeah. approach managers? Yeah. I think that, first of all, we need to, to look at Northvolt is um, employing some of the very best people. They are really recruiting people for grit and people with grit always have a lot of ideas and want to, you know, they have strive to make things better. And at the moment in Northvolt, it's almost like they have to be very careful not to lose sight of what they are there to do at the moment, which is mm. producing those batteries that are going to start coming out at the end of this year. So for them, it's really about honing in on those things that will make the process as such better at the moment, that will um, make it um, possible to deliver uh, to their clients at the moment. They could be expanding into so many different areas, I can tell you, because that there are so many ideas coming up at the, you know, on a weekly basis there, I would say. Uh, so for them, it's about really, you know, picking the things that are going to help them at the moment. And a very flat uh, organization and a very, you know, culture which is very much based around being bold, always challenging what can be done better, is the perfect foundation for really picking up those things as they go. Mm, that's really interesting because we have talked a little bit with some more traditional companies and uh, we often get questions in about how do we foster this culture mm. of entrepreneurship but actually if, if you've got that culture there are actually still some challenges mm. uh, working out how to pick and choose and, and, and which direction to go in. Um, one thing I've heard you say a lot about the company culture at Northvolt in particular was allowing for mistakes but not stupid ones. Mm. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that? Mm. I think that that's maybe something that is characterising truly innovative companies in general that they do uh, you know, see failure or, or mistakes, rather, uh, mistakes as something that is necessary in order to move on. But if the mistakes are committed because people were sloppy or because people didn't take the right measurements or that they could have been avoided, and especially if you commit them again, then that's not, um, that's not learning. So a mistake without learning is not an okay mistake, I would say. Um, and especially, I think that this dawned to me when, when Peter Carlson once said, Anna, he stared me in the eyes and said, you know, what we are doing here is there's a fine line between making a bomb and a battery. And then I realized, you know, we can't make mistakes here that are affecting others. We have to be really, really careful about, uh, you know, learning very, very early on how to make perfect uh, items. And that's where I also think that you can make mistakes where it doesn't affect others and you can make them very early on. And that's really good as long as you learn from them. And mm. I think that that's, that's a key thing. Learning, learning, learning. That's what you have to do. What are the other key things you need to do to foster a culture of entrepreneurship in a mm. company? Yeah, I think that, I mean, we're going to talk about some of the other things, organization and things like that. But if we take if think about the... The culture as such, I think that it's very important to try to, as a leader, if we, if we, if we think about it from a leadership perspective maybe, that you really um, push down the accountability, the, the empowerment into the organization where the people are working so that they feel responsible for solving the problems, that they can come up with ideas and that you encourage that um, innovative space and that you, when people are, are uh, you know, suggesting something, that you listen, that you at least, you know, don't immediately shut things down. And when you start to get this sort of uh, positive wheel uh, turning in, uh, in the right direction, then it's easier for others to fill onto that, you know, uh, latch onto that. And then uh, you have 
you start to get that culture in, in motion. You have to be a talent magnet, you have, you know, you have to have the right ta talented people around you. Um, but I think it's also very much about um, being curious as a mm. manager. Oh, uh, that sounds interesting. Tell me more. Mm. You know, just that question can sometimes spark someone's, you know, maybe being shy or maybe not really daring to come forward with something that might be the next big thing. Mm. You know, you don't want to lose out on that mm. as a company or as a manager. Let's talk a bit about talent attraction mm. and retention. This mm. is a really hot topic at mm -hmm. the moment. We know that a lot of people are job hopping. Yeah. Um, even though uh, we've we've had economic concerns during the pandemic, people have been reflecting on what they want to do next. I think uh, research showed the majority of workers in the US and the UK are looking mm -hmm. and browsing for a new job right now. So how do you think companies can make sure that they they keep the right talent and attract mm. the right talent in these mm. climates. Mm. Uh, yeah, it, it is a it is a challenge, and uh, the talent market is becoming tighter and tighter. I think uh, you know the right talent for talent we're all looking for basically the same. So you have to be very attractive as an employer. You have to listen to that specific group that you are looking to attract. Um, where I work right now, academic work, we make a really large survey every year called EPI, so Young Professionals Attraction Index. Uh, the results came out last week and it was super interesting to see, you know, what are the top 10 items that come out there uh, in terms of who, what do young talents, you know, the ones that are still at university, maybe five years ahead, what do they look for it. So what are they looking for? Uh, they are looking for some of the, the things that we are used to, you know, uh, interesting work, good manager, good compensation package. But there are some new things on the list that we found very, very interesting and they tie into what we are talking about today. Now, young professionals also want their company of, of choice to be a bit forward leaning. They want them to be innovative. They want them to be in the forefront. And that is something that is really new from the, for this year. And I think that that's something that we as employers need to think about, to be open for that, because that's going to attract that right talent. Very interesting, I think. Well, what will that mean for entrepreneurship? If mm. people are looking around a bit more, more open to job hopping, wanting to work for the mm. latest innovative company, is there not a danger that you know, projects will be started and not finished, and you know, people are just looking for the, for the latest hot trend? Of course, and that's why we need to really pay attention to what their needs and, and uh, interests are. If we can then, you know, offer them that right place, that right uh, challenging problem that they want to be part of solving, uh, the right environment, they are really, really interested in having other great co-workers around them, etc., etc. If we can offer that, then they are more, much more likely to stay. Mm. That it, it is as simple as that. And when they are in our company, we need to make sure that they can continue to develop, that they feel that they are not stagnating, that they feel that when they eventually leave, which is hopefully very far down the line, that they are becoming more employable. And as long as we can sort of tap, uh, you know, tap into their careers and uh, have them develop maybe in a slightly new direction, we can still attract them to stay with us but we need to stay close to them and we need to really listen to what they are after. Mm. Let's talk about how all this plays out at the organisational level, how you actually manage employees once they've been brought in, to, to give the right conditions really to encourage people to be innovative. I know you worked on this a lot during your time at Klarna, mm. mid-2017 to, to mid-2020, organising employees into teams. Mm -hmm. Tell us what that mm. looked like and mm. why you felt it was mm. necessary. Yeah. So Klarna sort of became a huge incubator of small startups. That's how they like to talk about it. Mm. So every person in Klarna was um, transferred into one of these, at the moment, 250 teams. I'm sure they are over 400 teams at the moment. Uh, between four and eight employees, that's the sort of the sweet spot for getting really good collaboration and engagement going in the team. And then they gave them the big task of sort of forming their own company. So they had their mission, their vision, their own problem space, and they got a lot of autonomy 
to actually execute on an end-to-end -end assignment, they also got all the different competences they needed in order to be able to be successful. Because that was one of the things that sort of sparked this whole thing. Before they were like 1,400 employees, now they are like 4,000, I think. So all the uh, on the journey to becoming a large company, already quite big, but they were always having bottlenecks, always, you know, uh, running into a problem that uh, one market or one area didn't get enough resources for something. So what they needed to do, they, or what they did, was that they reorganized and reorganized and reorganized, and people were sort of, yeah, um, motivation and uh, productivity went down and then up and up, up and up and down. So the new way of forming the company to all of these different teams is a much more uh, dynamic way of, you know, adding a team or uh, taking away a team. And now that the, the company has become in that way much more stable, the engagement has gone up tremendously and people are really feeling that they own their own problem space. They feel like they have a little company in the company. They are producing products. So they are like entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs with the safety of the company financial mm. muscle, of course, but they are then uh, free to invent and develop within those small entities. How transferable is this model? It's mm. clearly not a, a one mm. size fits all, but... Yeah, um, I think that, you know, the, the way of working is obviously then agile. Uh, every, 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 every one of these small little startups work in an agile way. They have quarterly uh, planning, um, weekly planning, uh, daily stand-ups, uh, uh, the retros, you know, the, the, the ways of working that agile contains. Um, I think that that is something that you can probably transfer almost to any, any company, but it takes it, it's a definitely a mindset, uh, a mind shift from working in long projects rather than working in small fast iterations mm. but if you look at it and if you get into it it's a far superior way I think of getting results and getting engagement for, from employees. I think that to do it on the scale which Klarna has done it is very difficult and it takes a lot of commitment from top management and you sort of you take away quite a lot of layers of, of management in between it's a flat organization and you have to be prepared to do that otherwise this will never fly but what you get away from are the different silos that can be mm. so detrimental to an organization's success and you sort of you, you pave it out uh, in the in uh, value uh, streams rather and you really think customer uh, as the absolute most important chapter for everything that you do. So I think that there are many gains if you try it out, but to do it at the scale of Klarna, not many companies uh, manage to do that. Yeah, um, <coughs> you've got about a thousand full-time mm. staff, 5,000 mm. in total. So mm. yeah, how innovative mm. is, is the culture mm. in the office? Well, I think it's quite innovative because we have our uh, Johan Skarberg, who is the CEO and, and founder of the company. He is sort of the, the, he's setting the pace for everything. He's still the big entrepreneur in the company, uh, even though he's not as active on a daily basis anymore. But he's really challenging everyone to think in this entrepreneurial way. He really wants people to uh, test new things move into other areas and it's also uh, a very i would say established culture that when an employee says i want to start up a company in uh, in city so and so or um, you know expand into a new country that has been the way that this company has actually grown and developed and also now starting up in different new areas that's also often coming from the employees themselves and then being then supported with someone who has done it himself, basically, but also being very positive and believing in people's uh, capacity and capability to actually accomplish these things and obviously then also getting the support. Mm. Really interesting. We've got a few questions sent in earlier from uh, the audience. Um, one is, uh, we have more men that are entrepreneurs in Sweden. What's your view when you look at intrapreneurs? Mm. Is, it, is it more even? I haven't I seen any stats on that, actually. Yeah, I think it's a super good question. And, and I can only give a very, you know, that's, that's my best guess. I would say that the, the, it, the figures look better then when it comes to uh, intrapreneurs. 
uh, just for you know looking around but I wouldn't know but we should definitely do some research on that and check that out I yeah think. definitely um, what's your advice uh, your best uh, tip for a leader who's trying to create an innovative, cu innovative culture that's mm -hmm. another audience question yeah well leadership is uh, a key in this that's that's for sure we know that uh, it uh, stands for maybe up to 78 percent of variance in team engagement so of course the manager is the key in all of this to allow for these things to happen we touched upon it uh, a little bit earlier uh, and i think that it's again it's about attracting the right talent being a talent magnet finding the talent around you and finding what people are good at we so often, or in a traditional company, as I would say, we, we focus on people's weaknesses. How can they develop? What they, do they need to improve? Instead, you know, if you want people to succeed, you should focus on their strengths. They are then much happier and they, you know, what you like to do, what you're good at, you spend more time on. And being an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, it does require quite a bit of time. It does require your passion, but it will always come from what you're great at. And as a manager, I think that that's one of the key things, how you can help employees is to really, you know, find and help them uh, develop what they are already really good at. Mm. So, uh, moving on, th this feeds quite well into what I was going to ask you next. I mean, not all employees necessarily have that drive, that, mm. uh, that mm. entrepreneurial mm. spark. Is, is there some kind of training that companies mm. can give to, to help people along this path? Or is it more about who we push into mm. the entrepreneurial, mm. entrepreneurial roles? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I'm not so sure about that you train someone into becoming an entrepreneur. I think you probably create the right kind of culture. And I think that that's what I can see in you know, the latest three companies where I've been. You know, it's the North Vault, it's Klarna, it's, it's now also in academic work. We have all these uh, behaviors that I think that we should sort of encourage and help people do more of. And that is like challenging the status quo. It's being courageous. It's being bold. It's, it's uh, you know, daring to test new things. And I think that, that those are probably going to help people more than just putting them on a training to become entrepreneurs. But I also think that helping people to move around in the company is also an excellent way not only to grow as an individual, which is obviously important, but it's also a, a, a way to uh, expose or have people uh, see things from a different angle when they start to understand how the whole company works then you can put two and two together and you can say, wow, this could be done in a different way. I have tested it in uh, you know, doing it from, from a, a, a completely different angle and I have seen these data or whatever it could be. And then I think that that is something that is also really helping entrepreneurship where you cross fertilize uh, from different angles of different um, competencies, if you like. Mm. We touched very briefly on gender in that question from mm. one of the viewers but uh, there's been so much research in recent years about how important diversity is in teams it can really help foster innovation boost company growth so I just wanted to mm. reflect a little on some of your business mm. experiences because you you've worked in a number of global Im environments I think you started studying Spanish at university and then your first major jobs at Ericsson were in Chile Austria and the UK mm. so first of all why did you want to work abroad why was that mm. attractive to you um, well, I guess I'm a curious person uh, to start with uh, and always wanted to learn new things, test new things, but also travel as such was a very you know, big thing when I was, was young. And then a way to travel very long <laughs> was to actually work in different countries. But it, it's also really, really rewarding, I think. You learn so much about yourself and about others by also being in, you know, going outside of your comfort zone. And, and uh, just um, testing out new things. Mm. Mm. So what were your key learnings from being exposed to different cultures, different international environments? Oh, that's a big question. Uh, key learnings from that. I think that, I, especially having worked in many international companies or, or, or global organizations, I think that working out there is probably the key to when you then get home, that you, you tend to become very obvious Swedish, we're headquarters. 
and you know you really have to wash that off you really have to be the representative of the markets out there and and be able to get into their shoes really understand what's going on out there not just sitting there in your ivory tower back in in headquarters um, thinking that you know everything the best out there is what the, you know what where the where the magic happens and you need to be able to to uh, align to that and uh, and have that in your blood mm. i mean travel is an interesting uh, topic to talk about now mm. as we're coming out of the pandemic as well people have traveled less mm. we don't know if these kind of long-term business opportunities or short-term business trips are going to be as feasible mm. what's your best guess do you do you think that business travel uh, at least for short-term conferences and things do you think that will start bouncing back i think we'll bounce back yes but not at all to the extent as they were. I think that we have realized that there are so many uh, ways of doing things in more effective ways, but we cannot replace the, the face-to-face meeting, the you know touching uh, mm. and, and hugging each other. It is uh, definitely going to um, be part of, of, of our going back to normal, which I'm very happy about, but I think that we've also, I mean, we know what hap- what's happening to climate, we cannot travel uh, as much as we have done Uh, so I think we're going to be very much more you know uh, picky about which are the occasions when we are going to travel we're going to do it on a much uh, lesser extent and we're going to be much more um, you know uh, thinking about it uh, so that it doesn't uh, go overboard again Mm, more mindful I guess so so what do you think the impact of this will be on innovation Mm. I guess there could be pros and cons. Mm. Yeah, I think that innovation for me, I mean, it, it in itself, this can be a source of innovation or shall we say, mm. you know, an area that needs to innovate more because I think that that is definitely what I have missed during the pandemic uh, is the, the brainstorming sessions, the being in, 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 in a room and, and putting up the yellow stickers and, and, mm. and you know, running forth and back and feeling the energy in the room and those things. So innovation, it's going to have to, you know, if we're going to be able to do that on a remote, I think, on a remote basis, we need them people to be able to feel that energy. Mm. They're going to come up with it. But I think that yeah. also um, that is um, something that we will definitely uh, continue doing. But innovation requires, I think, people to at least at some points meet and, and, uh, and um, yeah, the, the, there needs to be that little friction between people, I think. Yeah. But then there are long periods that is, is just discipline, that you, you're testing things, you are, you're developing. But I think the both of it, it, it is a combination that is necessary in order for this to become really, really yeah, I think so many discu- discussions around hybrid working mm. at the moment and people seeing just how much innovation mm. we've managed during yeah. the pandemic, but also what's been missing mm. from those uh, face-to-face brainstorms and those new experiences mm. from travelling and, and, and meeting different people. So I think it'd be really interesting to see how that all pans out. I mean, what's your best guess when it comes to the, the proportion of hybrid working mm. and, and what are you guys planning to do at... Mm. Um, at uh, academic work as we record this Mm. um the work from home recommendations here in sweden lifted just Mm. 24 hours ago yeah i mean we do um we want the the majority of time to be spent at work but we realize that uh, people will not go back to uh, fully in the office kind of working and it's not the best way to do it we think either we need to adapt to people's situations um, to people's lives uh, and to make it easy for them to to do a great work, job and i think that that's what we've all been very surprised about maybe during the pandemic we thought oh now everything is going to crash but sometimes we've seen in many companies productivity actually going up so it would be foolish of us to go back to the old uh, the old situation but then again we want people to come into the office we want them to meet and greet and have fun together share energy and and do all of these things as you say with innovation it, it requires a bit of of meeting as well mm. and there we as companies need to make sure that we have great places to work you know that people will want to come into the office, that it's better for them to come into the office than sitting alone at home. Yeah, huge topic here, really ranging from 
keeping that employee engagement because some mm. want to work from home mm -hmm. and creating mm -hmm. these special spaces. Mm. I think we could have a whole uh, mm. separate discussion mm. on that. Um, but we are running out of time, so I just want to wrap up. Mm. Um, I read that you've got this motto, which I thought it's it's a great way to sort of end our conversation. Hope is not a strategy. Mm. So tell us a little bit about mm. where that motto comes from, how mm. long you've had it and, and, and why it's important to you. Mm. I mean, it comes from a, a, a Lombardi, it's a, it's a football coach, uh, and it's a longer quote, really. But I, I love it because it keeps me focused on planning. Uh, and planning, I'm, I mean, I'm new at the moment, for example, at academic work. That's a little, very much about what I'm doing at the moment. Hope is not a strategy. I cannot guess, I cannot, you know, hope I'm partly right here. I need to find out, I need to research, I need to go talk to people, and I need to make a plan about what to do. Uh, then the plan is nothing, we all know that, but at least, you know, getting to know everything. So always getting into the details of things. So hope for me is never a strategy. But I think that hope is really a key uh, part of every successful strategy. Because you need, as a manager, also to be able to instill hope in people that we are going to succeed, that this is feasible, even though it's going to be tough, it's going to be, uh, you know, a lot of change. But hope is so central in becoming successful as well. Mm. Really wise words there, Anna. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure uh, talking to you about entrepreneurship, some of your uh, wider passions when it comes to developing people and a bit about your career as well. So thanks very much for joining us here at EVA. And thanks to all of you uh, who've taken the time to watch this. Uh, once again, sorry it wasn't interactive this time around. We hope that it will be uh, for our next uh, sessions. Uh, we will be publishing those on EVA's website in the coming weeks. So do check to see which uh, business leaders uh, we'll be speaking to next over the autumn and winter and for those of you who missed our first let's talk entrepreneurship session that was with uh, Eric Ekuden who is the group Group Chief Technology Officer at Ericsson. He has some really fascinating insights on entrepreneurship at one of uh, Sweden's largest and uh, best known uh, companies. So do log on, that interview is already available to watch. Um, but for now, from me, Maddie Savage, and everyone here at EVA, thanks very much, we'll see you next time. <laughs>